What's going on, everybody? And welcome into another edition of B Shafe Daily. Brendan Schaefer with you here on Thursday afternoon, April 6, 2023. No Cardinals game today. Cardinals have the off day. Good time for the off day, honestly. Coming off that sweep against the Braves. Chance to travel into Milwaukee, reset, and get going for the weekend series coming up against the division rival Brewers. That should be a pretty good series. Uh, Brewers off to a decent start to the season. And uh, obviously, they were the, the team that the Cardinals were most closely worried about, I guess, last year when it came to the division. They really faded down the stretch, allowing the Cardinals to take the central. But I think uh, most people expect if there's going to be a challenger in the division for the Cardinals this year, it's going to be Milwaukee. I sort of thought before the season that it would be the Cubs. Uh, we'll see what ends up happening with that. Right now, the Cardinals are 2-4. and four, So really, you could say it's anybody's division. But we'll, we'll end up seeing what happens there with uh, that game and talk about it more tomorrow on B-Shape Daily. Subscribe to the show on Spotify. You follow there. You subscribe on Apple Podcasts. And check out the YouTube page as well, youtube.com slash at bshafer12. And then patreon.com slash bshafer12 as well to support the show. Today, I had said we're going to talk about the starting pitching, and we'll do that. But what I also would like to get into is a play that happened on Wednesday that we didn't really scrutinize much at all because I don't think the broadcast had a replay of it that really showed what was going on. I'm talking about the play where Paul Goldschmidt got thrown out at home plate. I forget off the top of my head the inning that it was, but if you were watching the game, you remember the pop fly into shallow left field. It was kind of the Bermuda Triangle situation, no man's land. Uh, the Braves fielders couldn't figure out who was going to catch it, so nobody did. And Goldschmidt was rounding third base right around the moment that that ball was dropped. And he just never stopped. He kept going home. And wow, is that a funny play to happen in the aftermath of everything that went on with the Tyler O'Neill stuff, uh, which we'll give an update on uh, something that Ken Rosenthal talked about. I, I saw in his most recent article for The Athletic. I'm not going to talk a lot of Tyler O'Neill stuff today, but there is one little nugget that I want to make sure to mention uh, on today's B-Shape Daily. But yeah, coming off of the play that obviously has gotten a lot of publicity after Ollie Marmel questioned the effort of Tyler O'Neill, And he was out at home plate on the Acuna throw on Tuesday night by a pretty good margin. Well, it was the same story for Goldschmidt uh, from the left field side on Wednesday afternoon. And when I tweeted out and said, I don't even know what to say about this one, a lot of folks on Twitter replied, at Schaefer 12 replied to me on Twitter and said, okay, I want to know this. Well, did Pop Warner send him? Did the third base coach send him or was that Goldie doing it on his own and obviously the scrutiny over the play on Tuesday was was partially related to the effort that's what's gotten a lot of publicity I had wanted to talk about the fact that I thought it was a bad send by the third base coach so naturally the next day a similar play happens everybody's wondering okay what happened this time did he send him and I didn't reply to any of those tweets originally because I didn't have the answer uh, I was actually down very close to the field with an angle of the play but I didn't have any memory of like I wasn't thinking about it at the time and then I, I didn't have any memory of where was Pop Warner on this play and what was he doing I was just uh visiting some relatives down the third base uh side they were behind the Braves dugout some Braves fans they come by it honestly and I'm watching third base right in front of me and see Paul Goldschmidt round it and I go okay they're gonna gonna be a play at the plate but it turns out thanks to Matt Pauley of Camo X who had tweeted out the video and I, and I was getting a closer look at it on Thursday morning to, to confirm this. Pop Warner was nowhere in my line of sight because he was way down toward left field, uh, well beyond the third base bag. You've got the third base coaching box, right, that exists there on the sideline, and the coaches don't have to stay within that, but uh, a, a lot of times they, they are close to it, and Pop Warner was nowhere close to it. There's no way Paul Goldschmidt could have used him as a resource basically on this play is, is the bottom line. So, no, he didn't send him. He didn't do anything. I mean, he was standing there just watching with the rest of us, and I thought that was, uh, you know, a, a play that he probably should have been in a different spot. If he's up the line a little bit more toward home plate and that ball drops in, he'll be ready to look at it out of one corner of his eye and be able to, to know and, and have a, vi a field of vision for Paul Goldschmidt to tell him what to do, whether he needs to keep going or whether he should – take a sharp turn and, and, and retreat because there was, there was no fielder at third base. Like nobody could have tagged him. He could have gone halfway home and, and walked back to third base because everybody was there in shallow left field, the third base when the shortstop the left fielder, uh, the pitcher I don't think was covering at the time, uh, the third base bag. So 
there would have been an opportunity for uh, Paul Goldschmidt to take a really uh, wide turn around third and then be told by a base coach if he was in the right spot, no, 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 go back. I don't know if this is how the Cardinals see it. Ali Marmold, I don't believe, answered any questions about it yesterday. I know post game he didn't because I don't think anybody had really seen what developed. There was no, like I said, there was no replay. So unless you noticed it live, you you didn't notice Pop Warner basically just standing out there. Matt Pauley, if you follow him, you should on, on Twitter. Uh, does the the post game show on KMOX radio for the Cardinals games. He tweeted it out, so check it out. You'll be able to see the video. I've retweeted it on my feed at B Schaefer twelve. Uh, that's a weird one. That that's more cut and dry to me. And, and again, Ollie Marmel went pretty far to defend uh, the the third base coach Pop Warner from Tuesday and said there was no no issue with with him sending Tyler O'Neill. So maybe he would do the same thing when it comes to this play. I don't really think there's any defense of it though. And it's not like it's. I, I saw some people say, "Oh, it's a fireable offense." I don't think that. But he to me, he did get caught watching. And because it was very much a topic of conversation Tuesday, I thought it would have been. Um, you know, inappropriate to just ignore it Wednesday when another play happened and we look at it and go, I mean, if we're talking about effort, I just don't think – there were some people who said, oh, well, Paul Goldschmidt, that's really his call to make because the whole play is happening in front of him. And so if that's the way one fan sees it, I didn't agree with that, but uh, respect everybody's opinion. But if that's the way someone sees it, maybe Ollie Marmel saw it the same way and they don't see an issue with that either from, from Pop Warner. I, again, I'm trying to be objective here. I don't think there's that's the right the right spot to be in. Uh, Paul Goldschmidt, yes, he has it developing in front of him as he's round, going around second. He's coming through toward third, and he can see, you know, out of his right side field of vision what's going on there. However, he probably expects it to be caught, first of all. And then if it's not caught, is he still in the spot where he can see that, or is he rounded the third base bag, or is he approaching the third base bag as it happens? It's kind of a bang bang play. He'd have to be looking over his shoulder to know whether the ball was caught or not. He can hear the crowd probably cheer. And that might be a cue for him. And I didn't ask Paul Goldschmidt about it because I was on the highway back to my house to do the radio show on KTGR. So I didn't go in the clubhouse after the game. I don't know if it was if anybody asked Paul Goldschmidt about it. But I just thought, wow, he was kind of hung out to dry there by the third base coach. He didn't have any ability to know for himself. And so I can understand Paul Goldschmidt thinking, okay, ball drops in. The fielders are scrambling. This might be an opportunity to to take a run and make a play. But he had no way to know what was going on behind him, how quickly they picked the ball up. I think Pop Warner should have been 45 feet between home and, and, and third base and staying in front of Paul Goldschmidt after he's rounded third. But if it's a case where Pop Warner thinks the ball's going to be caught and he's he's not you know, thinking there's going to be a play, then that may be what happened there. And I think if that's the case, you talk about the effort of Tyler O'Neill, uh, you know, different roles I understand, but I, I don't think that's an effort play by the third base coach if it's a spot where he hangs Goldie out to dry because he's just standing there watching. He didn't He didn't signal go. He didn't put up a stop sign. He wasn't even in the field of vision once Goldie was rounding third because he was way down the line. You can check it out. Matt Pauley put it out there on YouTube. But I wanted to bring that up because I thought it was a little bit uh, strange, and I thought it was something that people probably uh, maybe didn't see on Wednesday. And given the discussion that we've had about pace running this week, uh, certainly is one that I, that I believe is uh, relevant here. So check that out. If you haven't, let me know what you think at B. Schaefer 12. And then, as I alluded to, just one note about Tyler O'Neill uh, before we kind of shift our conversation for the rest of the show to talking about the starting pitching because it has really been a problem for the Cardinals in the first week. Uh, six guys have thrown, five guys, and, and then Michaelis has thrown twice. And I, I know people are kind of wondering how I view that and how generally that should be considered because – it hasn't been a good start at all for the rotation, but is it a case of playing against good teams? Where does the truth lie? So we'll kind of go in into some of that in detail as well. But Ken Rosenthal for The Athletic had a piece out today, a little bit of notes from around the league, and, and touched on the Tyler O'Neill thing. And one sentence in that article mentioned that the Cardinals had discussed trade possibilities with the Marlins regarding Tyler O'Neill in the offseason. And he says, among other teams, Cardinals have a surplus of outfielders. They don't have enough starting pitching. Rosenthal wonders if they could maybe move O'Neill for a pitcher or an outfielder in general to get a starting pitcher, but says, uh, depending on how he responds to Marmol's criticism, they are risking devaluing him further in terms of traits. My thing about it is you're going to see, you know, Ken Rosenthal linking the Cardinals and Marlins on a Tyler O'Neill trade. And I feel like that's a topic we brought up in the off season. Uh, but my thought at the time, and certainly nothing that we've seen in the first week of the year would change that because, again, he, his value is probably going down, not up. If 
other teams say, oh, the Cardinals might be desperate to unload him, you know, that, that doesn't help the, the team recoup any additional trade value for you. But in the offseason, my take was, I don't think the Marlins won Tyler O'Neill. I thought they might want a lefty power bat for their outfield. O'Neill is a right-handed bat. Uh, Skip Schumacher is plenty familiar with him I, as the, the manager of the Marlins. Now, I just don't think that would be someone the Marlins are interested in. It would surprise me if they were interested in giving a starting pitcher for Tyler O'Neill. So that's if that's a rumor that you see flying around or, or something that I mean, was reported by Rosenthal that they talked about in the offseason. When these things are reported, that can mean the Cardinals floated Tyler O'Neill to the Marlins, and the Marlins said, no thanks. Like, that that could have been the extent of the talks. We don't know. It doesn't mean that they got very far. It means that this was a case of a reporter finding out about the various conversations that happened throughout the year between team to team. They found out about this one, and so it gets reported. Sometimes, a lot of times, those things probably don't become public, and they never gained any traction, so it didn't need to become public. But now that there's news about Tyler O'Neill. You've got a guy like Ken Rosenthal who does a great job reporting as a, a national insider. You know, he's got reason to, to write about it and talk about it. And so he's going to kind of shed some light on what he knew was taking place in the off season. I don't know that it's something that ends in a Tyler O'Neill trade, certainly not in April or May, right? How often historically have the Cardinals made those types of moves? Not very frequently uh, out of desperation or anything like that. So it would surprise me to see, um, at least for the time being. We'll see. I don't think it's going to be a case either where he's benched for the whole weekend. He might he might not be benched at all. Like, he was benched for a day. Ollie did not say it was specifically because of the, the brouhaha. Uh, he just was asked that and said, no, uh, Dylan Carlson is in center field today. So that was his way of saying, I'm not touching it. I just, but, you know, I think we can read between the lines and know that that was probably what happened. Uh, Tyler O'Neill, to his, for his part, said he, it was a scheduled off day for him anyway, like that he was supposed to be off that day. Um, who really knows? It doesn't really matter. I think he's going to probably, if, if I had to guess, will he be in the lineup on Friday, yes or no? I would guess yes. So, and if it's not Friday, it'll be one of the other games of the weekend. Um, but if Dylan Carlson, like we talked about the window of opportunity yesterday, if Dylan Carlson continues to um, take that opportunity and run with it, you can see the playing time certainly shift, especially though when you get in, into a, a period where Lars Nupar is back from the IL. But that's still going to be a number of days. So, uh, and I, in, as of yesterday, when we were talking with Ollie uh, before the game on Wednesday, he did not know whether Lars would make the trip, uh, the road trip with the team. And so if he doesn't, then I, I think that's a pretty good indication that he'll probably be back for the following homestand. If he does, he could maybe rejoin and, and actually be activated later on, probably in the Colorado series, um, which I guess would be next week, early next week. So that's the way I look at that. Uh, you might see that tidbit from Rosenthal. And so you might've been wondering what, What's the, you know, what's that got to do with anything? Well, that's kind of what I think. I don't see a Cardinals Marlins trade for O'Neill happening, um, but time will tell. I mean, there are going to be those speculations that if teams look around at him and go, hey, if the Cardinals aren't happy with him, maybe we could use him. But is that really a situation where the Cardinals are dealing from depth um, and from a position of strength? No, at that point, they're probably dealing from a position of, uh, well, teams think we're desperate to trade this guy. So, they think they're going to be able to get a discount. And if you're the Cardinals, you don't really have any incentive to do that. Um, patience is is a virtue, I think, in this situation. And this all is going to die down. We probably, I wasn't going to bring it up at all again today, but it was the case of the Goldschmidt thing. And I thought it was somewhat relevant. And so I wanted to kind of tie that in. And uh, now we've talked about it. But let's go ahead and talk about the starting pitching. I said we would. And uh, we should. Because it's a case where the Cardinals have really struggled in, in one area of the game. And that's been it. I mean, their bullpen if I were to look at the, the splits on, on starting versus relieving, which I guess I could do, might take me a minute uh, if you indulge me here, it's been much better, at least it feels like it has been, from the bullpen side of things. Starting pitching the Cardinals every game in that Braves series, you were down before the Cardinals even came to bat. First inning of each of the games, they allowed runs. So that's not what you want, and the Cardinals have got to find a way to, to level that out. And it's not like the starters were terrible after that. It feels like it because it, when it's happening bad at the beginning, you're just left to be like, okay, I have a, a nasty taste in my mouth about the way this game is going for the Cardinals starting pitching. But honestly, I don't know that, like it could have been worse, I guess, is the way that I would frame it because Michaelis settled down a little bit yesterday. Steven Matz the day before that, after a, a rough beginning, had two and a third innings of scoreless baseball to get through uh, five and a third after the, the, the three innings that were a little tougher for him. I think they had scored runs in each of the first three, and then over the final two and a third, 
no runs came across. So if you want to look at the bright side of it, first you could acknowledge that they're playing against some really good lineups, and that makes it more difficult. And then you could say that they're finding ways to settle in. But it's the same thing that we talked about with Jordan Hicks the other night. The Cardinals want Jordan Hicks to be ready to go for the first batter of, a, of an appearance, not later on. And I think the same thing could apply to the starting pitching. Get up for that first inning because you can potentially lose the game there. I mean, with the runs that the Cardinals have given up the last two games, they didn't score more than they allowed, right? They they That's going to sound dumb. They didn't score more in nine innings than they allowed in the first two in either of those games. So you, you can play offense for nine innings and, and come up short and put yourself in, in that position where you're behind the eight ball the way that they did with the starting pitching being as poor as it was uh, for those early innings. They were able to settle in, and that's great. You need to give, you know, five, six innings if you're a starter. Michael just goes six yesterday, but he gave up the five runs. They all happened a little earlier in the outing. You you can't play from behind like that and expect to be successful often, especially when you're going to have days where you do hit into hard luck. Like the offense, I, I still would say for the Brave series, took good at bats. Um, all around, it was pretty solid. They just didn't get rewarded for it in a lot of cases, and there are going to be days like that. But if you can have your starting pitching hold it true and keep it to maybe be a 2-1 to one game or a 3-1 to one game instead of 5-1, to one, you're going to find that you're going to be able to come back in those games a little bit more. In the offense, it shouldn't matter, right? They should be pedal to the metal no matter what the game score and circumstances. But human nature, if you're down 5, you might not be as inclined to get up for it until – you find that spark. Somebody gets a base hit and then doubles them in, and then suddenly the line's moving and everybody's jazzed about it. When you're down by multiple runs, you've got to that's got to come from somewhere. Somebody's got to be able to uh, take that mantle and pick it up. It's a lot easier to do that if your starting pitching keeps you in the game. I think that's just human nature. But checking out the Cardinals' uh, pitching stats this season, from the bullpen, they've got a 3.24 ERA, which ranks ninth in baseball in reliever ERA. So 3.24, I mean, if that was your total ERA, you're allowing three, maybe sometimes four runs per game on average that are earned, that'd be pretty good. I mean, you're going to win a lot of games that way. But the problem is the starting pitching. 7.14 is the ERA. The teams that are worse than Major League Baseball so far, the Boston Red Sox, who their starters have had an eight ERA. That is abysmal. And then the Oakland Athletics, who are going to be the, end up being the worst team in baseball, I think, this year with a 7.94 ERA. Those are teams that are, I mean, they're going to be non-playoff teams. I think the Red Sox, they might not be terrible, but they're the worst team in their division. You're down there in the in the muck with some of the worst teams in, in baseball, potentially. Talking about a 7.14 ERA from your starters. Um, it's got to be better. It's got to be better for the Cardinals. I do, I do, though, believe there is a chance for it to get better. I want to look at the innings as well. Uh, they rank 23rd in starter innings at just 29 innings from their starters. Uh, they've played six games, though. Some teams have played seven. But over the course of six games, if you've got 20, what I say, 29, 29 innings, that's fewer than five innings per game. It doesn't even seem like it should be right, but I guess it is because you've only had one guy go six, and you've had a couple guys go below five. So, yeah, they're averaging under five innings per start. The starts have not been effective. They've not been lengthy. The bullpen has done a nice job. To be able to have a 3.24 ERA with the amount of usage that they've had, I think that is something to be impressed by because it's a lot easier to, if you're just throwing one or two or three innings a night, be effective. You're not as tired. You haven't been worked as long, as as, as difficult of, of an assignment when you come into a game in the fourth or fifth inning and have to cover the rest of the way. That's not easy for a pitching staff, and so give the Cardinals bullpen credit. I didn't think coming into the season – uh, well, I, I guess I shouldn't say I didn't think it would be a good unit. I just was concerned about aspects of it. Like, I liked Drew Verhagen. I called that called my shot on him. He's been fantastic, and I thought he would be. Um, so I'm, I'm not trying to, to dunk that basketball yet, but I do feel like I said it before the season. He's going to be their best reliever. That was my one of my calls that I made in my tweet about the season predictions. Uh, and, and so far, that seems to be like something that could actually hold up there for the Cardinals. But you've got other guys like Helsley's going to be Helsley. We haven't really seen what Gio is going to be. I think he's only pitched like one time. Uh, you know, there there are questions in that bullpen coming into the year that I just didn't know what the roles were going to work out as. Jordan Hicks has obviously struggled. But I think two key parts of what the Cardinals have been able to do over the past week, Packy Naughton and Chris Stratton have both done a nice job. 
Uh, Packy, I don't think, has given up a run. Stratton's ERA is like in the twos uh, or, or about three after he's been used a few times. They've been able to cover some innings that were not glamorous by any stretch of the imagination. Those were games that Cardinals weren't out of them, but they needed to have those guys pitch well to stay even remotely close in the game, which happened. The the big hits didn't come late enough uh, for the Cardinals to be able to come back in those games. But to think that they were still in the mix, that's what you got to do. You got to put yourself in position over 162 games, have as many of them be competitive as possible. Ideally, you'll win some of them in blowout fashion, but you got to at least be competitive in as many of the losses as you can be because that's the only way a loss or a perceived loss is going to turn into a win is by keeping it close and, and grinding out at bats and seeing if you can't do it. The, the bullpen's responsible for setting the tone, though, there. And they've been able to do that. I don't know how long, though, you could expect that to hold up with the consistency of the bullpen if the starters don't start giving you something a little bit more. You know, it's it's just not reasonable to think. We talked about this last year. It seemed like the middle of the summer, the, the starting pitching had a month where it was just really brutal and everybody's clamoring for the deadline need to make a move. It's It's hard to sustain that when you get into the middle of the season. You might get away with it in April because the, the, the relievers are fresh. They haven't had the mileage on their arms this season, and so they might be able to bounce back a little bit quicker. But you get into the later portion of the season when everybody's sore, everybody's hurt, and it doesn't mean they're injured. It just means they're going through it because it's been a long campaign. That's where you kind of say, all right, can the starters give us those days where somebody goes seven or eight and you save the bullpen in that way? That's what the Cardinals are going to need, I think, in this series against Milwaukee. Uh, which I, I believe they're just rolling through the rotation the exact same way they did. So it should be uh, Jack Flaherty on Friday, then Montgomery Saturday, and Woodford would be Sunday. Um, what do I expect from these guys? Flaherty, I think, can have a good start. I think he can buckle down and find it because, again, he wasn't giving up hard contact. He wasn't really giving up any contact. He had no hits allowed uh, in his first outing. But the seven walks are, uh, yeah, you don't want to see that from anybody, especially your your guy that's supposed to be your ace but Jack Flaherty had such a good demeanor about him after the game that I think you're going to see a different version I would expect him to come out and pitch really well on Friday that's the way I look at that uh, Montgomery I think will be better again he's another guy that allowed three runs over the first couple of innings and then he settled in uh, to pitch five hopefully it's a rust factor hopefully it's uh, the Atlanta Braves are a World Series contender factor the Blue Jays are a World Series contender factor those lineups are really really good and so I, I think we are going to have a, a disproportionate view of the Cardinals rotation at this point in the season because of what we've seen them up against. Now, that doesn't mean, and, and I've seen it perceived this way, when people say, hey, you played some really good lineups there, don't overreact to the struggles of the pitching staff, uh, the starting pitching staff in particular. The response that some people have to that is, well, hey, when you get into October, that's going to be good lineup one after another, and that's what the Cardinals' issue was last year. They couldn't win in October. Okay, that's true about last year. And it's true that you'll see those good lineups in October. But, like, to get enough wins to get to October is the prerequisite. You've got to start with that. That's the, That's got to be the first thing that happens, right? And I certainly think the Cardinals, with the pitching they have, at least in the rotation, and then guys that could come up from Memphis and, and the minor leagues to supplement as the summer goes, I still think the Cardinals are going to win the division. I I I think they're going to have enough games against the teams that they can pitch effectively against without having it be such a strain. They're going to have enough of those, and they're going to be all right. So you got to get in first. I still believe, even after what we've seen over the first week, that they can do that. The next question becomes, well, what happens when you get into the playoffs against some of those teams? I'll point back to last year. The starting pitching was not the reason the Cardinals did not win that series against the Phillies, right? They had game one in the position they wanted to, uh, and and the, the Ryan Helsley thing happened. So that was a, an example. And then game two was not, you know, Miles Michaelis I think was fine, and it, it just they didn't score enough runs in that game. Um, I, I don't remember the score off the top of my head, but you can go back and look. I just don't think that the starting pitching was the reason in, in October last year that they didn't get the job done. Um, they could find themselves in pitcher's duels with guys like Michaelis. Uh, maybe Jack Flaherty steps forward. But bottom line, for the Cardinals to succeed in the playoffs, your MVP caliber players have to hit. And unfortunately, last year they didn't. And so for me, that was the difference. It was Ryan Helsley having an injured finger and the the lineup that tied for fifth and run scored or whatever it was in Major League Baseball last year did not have a good run of things over those couple of games. 
So I understand everybody's concern about pitching, but if I look at starting pitching from last year, I go, yeah, it was an issue during the season, and it, it might be an issue again this season. But I don't think it was the reason they failed in the playoffs. I think that offense and a fluke thing happening to their closer is why they got knocked out of the playoffs early. But I agree if you want to win the World Series or get to the World Series, you have to have guys, four of them probably, in a playoff series and then in a, a additional playoff round after that to continue advancing. You've got to have more guys on point than the Cardinals have right now. But some of those guys were very good down the stretch last year. Jordan Montgomery was very good late last year. Mike Lewis was was a, a very good arm for them last year. Jack Flaherty has been that guy in the playoffs before. Think about the Padres series in 2020. So they've got the guys that have the experience doing it, and let alone Adam Wainwright, who could could certainly turn into that guy once again. I'm not like I've said before. I'm not doubting him anymore. So while I think that it is a situation where it's not ideal, and we talked about this on the big show today on KTGR, and we gave letter grades out. I said the Cardinals were a B so far this season. But the way I break that down is A for the offense, A minus for the bullpen, pretty much a D minus for the starting pitching. So I'm grading it kind of the same way everybody else is, unless you're saying, oh, it should be an F, then I would understand that, I guess. But I look at the way that the starters have been able to pretty much every time after the bad first couple of innings settle down and give you five or six, I'm going to count that for something, I think, for the Cardinals, which you might say that's given away a participation award and, and we really don't need to be doing that. But if they don't cover innings three, four, and five effectively, they give up nine runs instead of four or five. And it's a, a different situation, I think, that you're in. But hey, ERA is 7.14. It's third from the bottom of baseball. It has to be better for the Cardinals. I think the starting pitching will get there. But each game that happens where that doesn't come to fruition it, it the concern definitely does grow, but we've got 156 more of these games. Uh, at a certain point, you just have to kind of see it play out for a few turns through the rotation. Um, and then, yes, John Lozalak again is is going to have to be ready if if they don't if they don't have the pieces within, he's going to have to be ready to go out and get some help if if it's required. Um, but the Cardinals are crossing their fingers right now that it won't be. Do you buy it as a fan? Let me know at B Schaefer 12 on Twitter. Uh, it's certainly going to continue to be a primary topic of conversation when it comes to this baseball team. There's no doubt about that.